I will always hold a candle for you. Written by Bear. He could just make out the soft glow in the distance as he stared out of his window. The light was coming from a window on the other side. On days like today it could be lost in the swell of the sea mist as it rolled its way slowly up the sides of the valley. However, at the moment he could still see it. This pleased him. The light made him feel reassured. Comforted, somehow. He'd never been able to place the building where the light came from. That didn't matter. So long as he saw the light. Most evenings, he sat amongst his thoughts, staring out to sea, watching the waves dancing on the shore. Or on more windy and stormy nights, they pounded on the beach, as if it had caused the sea to vent its anger on the stones. It wasn't that he had a problem with alcohol. In fact, he didn't. He just enjoyed the warm feeling of numbness it provided. His life had lost its edge since he lost Hannah. He no longer put any heart into what he did. Lost. That seemed to be such a meaningless word. It sounded as if he had misplaced her. He would never have done that. She had almost instantly become the reason for his living. He remembered that night as if it were yesterday. That is such a cliché, but it was true. He had walked into the bar where the band were playing, had scanned the room for his sister who would be there with a friend. He saw Hannah before he saw his sister. In fact, he can't even recall seeing his sister. All he could see was the girl with the open smile and the sparkling eyes. He knew at that moment what effect she would have on him. The look she returned had sealed the deal. This was for eternity. When he spoke to her, which he couldn't help, she was softly spoken with a trace of a whisper and her scent he could only describe as a scent of beauty. It was not because of a perfume, but something that emanated from her. Their natural conversation that night had led to a ten-year relationship that was to haunt him for the rest of his life. His trips to the supermarket were few and far between. He tried to avoid them as they represented normality. He no longer felt normal. Most of his food came from the small local shops or the fishermen's stalls on the beach. The only reason for the supermarket was that it was the only place that sold his favourite, Plymouth Gin. Seemed so ridiculous, as you could get other brands from other shops, but this was what they had always drunk, and so it seemed right, both morally and to suit his taste. It was whilst on one of these jaunts that he first saw her, as he passed the end of the drinks aisle, something made him turn and look. There she was, her smile dancing on her face. It made him smile involuntarily. He caught himself, but it was too late. She had seen. She smiled in his direction, then looked back to the shelf. As he was in the queue to pay, he found himself surveying the other queues to see if he could see her. A rush of guilt washed over him. How could he even think? She had always said, no one can avoid the appreciation of beauty wherever it comes from. This had not made him feel any better, as she was no longer with him. When he got home, he was aware that he had not stopped thinking about her. In the twenty years since Hannah had been taken, yes, that's what it was, taken so cruelly from him, he had never even glanced at another woman. How could he? No one could ever fill her place. Ever. The next time he went to the supermarket, which was nearly three weeks later, he began systematically searching the aisles for this girl. Well, he referred to her as a girl, but she must have been about the same age as him. Maybe mid-fifties, but she seemed like a girl to him. 
He wasn't expecting to find her, let alone so suddenly, and to have such a close encounter. As he was waiting in the queue to pay, a voice, a soft, gentle voice from behind him, said, You can't beat Plymouth, it's the best. He turned quickly, too quickly, as the voice sounded so familiar. Yes, he stuttered. West Country. He turned back and paid for the gin and hurried out of the store. West Country. West Country. What was he thinking? He felt like a teenager and he was sure his face had reddened. Why had he made such a banal, irrelevant statement? What must she be thinking of him? It was this last question that made him think. Why was he even concerned about what she might be thinking about him? This made him feel guilty again. Despite such feelings of guilt, he had decided the next time, whatever it took, he would try to rectify the fact that he'd made such a fool of himself. It was another couple of weeks before he visited the supermarket again. Two weeks? Had he been deliberately drinking the gin faster than usual? He had already collected his bottle when he saw her in the queue. He stood behind her and gathered himself. I find a slice of lime with a slice of lemon is good, he noted, as he could see no limes in her basket. I've never tried that, she replied, but I would like to. He knew what his response should be. It was so easy and she'd set him up perfectly. He said nothing. He smiled clumsily. I see you have limes. Why don't you bring your limes and you can show me what it tastes like? It was so simple. So easy. Although he felt a tinge of guilt, there was something, almost beyond his control, that led him to agree. He followed her out of the shop and they walked together up the hill that led to the opposite valley to his. There was small talk, but it didn't seem to be in any way awkward. It felt almost natural, but how could it? When they sat in her front room of her little flat, she lit a candle and carefully placed it in the window. As she did this, she asked, Where exactly do you live? It was almost as if she knew, because her eyes were fixed in the distance on the far side of the valley, his side, where his house was. When he told her, she smiled and didn't ask for any detail. As they sipped their gin, the conversation was minimal, but for some reason it didn't feel awkward. He got up and walked to the window to see if he could see his house. She got up and stood next to him, right next to him. He could feel her. He could smell her. What was it? There was something about her scent. He turned to look at her, and she turned at the same time. The kiss was inevitable, yet he couldn't understand why. She took his hand and led him away to the bedroom. He hesitated, but she turned and said, by way of explanation, we're grown-ups, you know, and we can do what we like. They made love. He didn't understand. How could that be? He didn't know her. Yet they made love. It wasn't sex or a one-night stand. It was full of the passion that only real, true love can bring. How was that so? Also, his body felt as if it were younger somehow, more languid and supple. He didn't feel the aches and pains of age as he was getting used to. The whole evening began to take a very dreamlike turn. He cannot remember how long he stayed that night. Everything had seemed to be as if in a dream. He couldn't even remember walking home or carrying his bottle of gin with the limes. His shopping bag was on the kitchen table where presumably he'd left it the night before. He decided to try and find the house where she'd lived. He walked across the town to the other side of the valley and up the street where she lived. He thought he'd found the building where her flat was. He found that quite easily, but couldn't find the side gate that led through to her flat. As he was looking puzzled 
at the house, someone came out from the front door. He stopped them and asked if they knew... knew who? He didn't know her name. He asked if they knew the girl that lived upstairs at the back. The woman responded quite sharply. There's no one at the back upstairs. That's part of my property. The only other person in the building is the old lady downstairs. There was no response that he could think of, or even make, that would have solved this mystery. She could not possibly live there. How was that so? He returned home and sat down by his window and poured himself a gin and tonic with both lemon and lime. He noted that there was one lime missing from last night. He absent-mindedly looked out of the window. As dusk was falling, he noted the yellow light on the distant hill. Yellow light. A candle. He rushed, and as quickly as he could manage, he made his way back to the street where he thought she had lived. He knocked on the door of the house, and, for the second time that day, he was confronted by the woman who lived there. She was a little angrier this time, and almost closed the door on him. But he managed to persuade her just to respond to one question. Had she lit a candle in a back upstairs window? No, I have not, she replied angrily. Candles are very dangerous, and I would not allow them in the house. When he got home, he sat down by the window and scrutinised the view. Yes, he could see a candle. As he was looking, he remembered what she had said. We are grown-ups. He also remembered when Hannah had said the self-same thing to him all those years ago. Then he recalled what Hannah's last words were to him. I will always hold a candle for you.